Gustav, a male Nile crocodile from Burundi, is rightly considered one of the most famous and also one of the most feared predators in Africa. It's a man-eating crocodile with an extensive record of attacks on humans. It's estimated that since 1987, he's killed up to 200 to 300 people on the banks of the Razizi River and the northern shores of Lake Tanganyika. There are different accounts about Gustav, even his exact length and weight are unknown. This crocodile is too elusive to be measured properly. In all the years that people have known of his existence, Gustav has never been caught. However, in 2002, it was stated that the crocodile could be easily more than 20 feet long and weigh more than 2,000 pounds. If these estimations are at least partially true, Gustav could be three times the size of other crocodiles in Burundi and also claim the title of one of the largest crocodiles in Africa. Actually, when you start looking for information about Gustav, it seems that he's some creature the locals simply made up. Well, it just doesn't add up. Think about it, if the crocodile is actually that big, then he must be about 100 years old. Still, when they managed to see Gustav with his mouth open, it turned out that he had a full set of teeth inside. A hundred-year-old crocodile simply couldn't have that, which means Gustav is about 60 years old. How did he get so big? It's unclear. And it looks like he'll get even bigger over time. Maybe it's all about his terrifying diet. Gustav follows it diligently, particularly during mating season when he travels along the banks of the Razizi. And this is when he's at his most dangerous. The man-eating crocodile even reaches remote areas, eating everyone he comes across along the way. Usually, these are fishermen and bathers, and it's believed Gustav can eat 10, 15, or even 20 people. Moreover, Gustav seldom eats all of his prey, which leads locals to speculate that he doesn't do it because he's hungry. Gustav simply enjoys killing people. Hello. I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> I'm gonna slice you up. Um, you're, you're behind the couch. <laughs> Due to his notorious reputation, people made multiple attempts to catch Gustav, but all their efforts have been unsuccessful. One time, a special cage trap weighing a ton and measuring almost 29 feet was designed, just the right fit for a big predator. The team then located Gustav, set the trap in a suitable location, and placed a hidden infrared camera inside. Several types of lures were used, but none of them attracted Gustav or any other creature. It seems the monster just ignored the attempt. The scientists then strategically placed three more traps on certain banks to increase their chances to catch the monster. That should have worked. And it sort of did, except that the traps caught smaller crocodiles while Gustav escaped again. By the way, the idea that Gustav's size is related to his diet is not something Steve and I came up with, although scientists propose a similar theory. They believe the connection works the other way around. The crocodile's unusual size and weight simply wouldn't let him hunt the usual agile prey like fish, antelope, and zebra. He has to choose bigger prey, hippos, buffalo, and humans. And given that crocodiles can survive without food for a very long time, Gustav can afford to be picky when choosing his prey. So it seems to me that all these attacks on humans are not an accident or a consequence of starvation, as is often the case with other predators. But we'll come back to that a bit later. In 2016, Gustav disappeared somewhere, and after that, the attack stopped. In a 2019 article about traveling in Burundi, the journalist of Travel Africa magazine reported that Gustav had been killed, but there's no record of who did it, when, or how. No photos or other evidence. Nothing. Whether Gustav is alive or not is unknown, but the locals are still afraid of him. The crocodile has long been something like the mythical Nessie. The only difference being that Nessie doesn't have a death count of several hundred people. Despite this, the tales surrounding Gustav became increasingly surreal with each passing year. People who saw him described the crocodile as some very weird animal. Some said that Gustav was red or yellow. Some claimed to have seen jewelry on his neck. And some were even certain that clumps of grass were growing out of the crocodile's head. Gustav's appetite also became legendary. It's said that the crocodile once ate more than a dozen people, but still remained hungry. How exactly the people could have known this is unclear. Well, these are horror stories after all, not documented facts. Gustav actually seems like a nice guy compared to Champawat Tiger, who's said to have been responsible for an estimated 436 deaths in Nepal and India in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The tiger's attacks have been listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the highest number of fatalities from an animal. The tiger didn't just kill anyone she came across, 
she carefully devised a strategy and adjusted it to evade people who hunted her. The tiger traveled up to 20 miles between villages to find new victims. Most were young women who often went into the woods to get firewood, feed cattle, or gather other resources, and all of the kills occurred during the daytime. Life in the region was paralyzed, with men even refusing to leave their huts for work when they heard the roar of a tiger in the forest. It's said that the villagers didn't leave their homes at all for five days straight. Hunters decided to take the matter into their own hands, but the tiger easily evaded any beats. The Nepalese army was summoned, but it failed to capture or kill the animal either. One point for the tiger, zero for the army. However, the soldiers managed to drive the predator out of the area and across the border into India. Did this help the tiger change her eating habits? Nope. She continued to kill people, just in a different country. The story of the Chapawa tiger ended only in 1907 when a British hunter, Jim Corbett, followed her trail. He was nearly ambushed by the animal but managed to scare it away with two shots and came back alive. The next day, Corbett organized a beat with about 300 villagers, people swept the area, and finally by noon, Corbett had shot the tiger. The celebratory feast lasted well into the night, as expected. Though it remained unclear why the tiger was killing people in the first place, let alone in such numbers, when the body of the predator was cut open, it was revealed that her upper and lower canine teeth on the right side of her mouth were broken. The upper one in half and the lower one right down to the bone. This injury, a result of an old gunshot, probably prevented the tiger from hunting normal prey, so she had to switch to humans. From the tiger's point of view, it's very easy to eat humans. We can't run away or fight back without a weapon. Easy meal. But can a predator get so used to human flesh that it can't stop eating it? Well, if we can trust the experts, it's the big felines that have this issue. The reason lies in salt. There's more of it in human blood, and predators, once they've tasted our blood, no longer want to eat some deer. People make for a more delicious meal after all. However, this habit requires a learning process based on previous experience. This is not possible unless the predator can encounter the food source frequently. But you know that people keep encroaching into the habitat of wild animals every year, so such encounters happen quite often. So an animal can indeed become addicted to human blood. This is not a myth. For this to happen, a number of factors must come into play, with the inability to hunt normally being the primary factor. It doesn't matter what caused it – a large size, as in Gustav's case, or broken teeth, as in the tiger story. Many man-eating predators are injured or simply too old. Some have been cut off from their usual prey sources, and some have become quite fond of the taste of human flesh. Seems like they appreciate meat with ample seasoning. By the way, that same hunter, Jim Corbett, saved people not only from the tiger, his kill count includes the leopard of Pinar. This is another famous predator, almost as deadly as the Champawat tiger. More than 400 people are believed to have been killed by this leopard in northern India. And yes, the attacks occurred in the same area where the tiger hunted. But could there have been two man-eating animals sharing the same area? Seems to be too much. According to scientists, the geography of the area was a factor in the leopard of Pinar's rampage. The area was remote and there were obviously not enough firearms and hunters. People from other regions mostly turned a blind eye to what was going on and the leopard did what it wanted. This large and strong animal would attack people returning home at dusk or even get inside their homes at night and devour as many victims as it wanted. None of the locals were brave enough to stand up to it. Stealthy, aggressive, brave, able to climb and preferring to attack at night, the leopard was a real nightmare. It knew how to spot traps, disguised itself perfectly, and masterfully avoided encounters with humans if it wanted to. The leopard was rarely seen until the very last moment when it struck. That all changed when Jim Corbett, hired by the authorities specifically to kill man-eating animals, arrived in the region, and as you may have realized, Corbett was good at what he did. Unlike tigers, which often resort to hunting humans because of injury or old age, man-eating leopards are generally healthy animals. This makes them even more difficult to catch. Eventually, the hunters won. Corbett staked out the goat as bait and hid in the nearest tree, which he covered with thorns. The leopard ignored the goat and instead focused on trying to reach Corbett, knowing that there was something more delicious in the tree than just goat meat. The predator went for the goat only after all attempts to climb up were unsuccessful. That's when the hunter pulled the trigger. The wounded leopard escaped, but the next day it was hunted down and killed. Later, it was revealed that the leopard had been feeding on human flesh because of the cholera epidemic. There were lots of human corpses in the jungle and not enough of the usual leopard food. 
Well, how could one resist? But man-eating animals don't always work alone. There can also be man-eating prides. Between 1932 and 1947, a pride of 15 lions in Njombe was responsible for the deaths of hundreds, possibly up to 1,500 people, making them the deadliest killers on record. Before these tragic events, the colonial government reduced the number of predatory animals in the area in an attempt to deal with an outbreak of plague that was destroying herds of cattle. Hungry lions quickly found a substitute and switched to human flesh. Unlike most lions, the Prida and Jombe killed during the day, using the night hours to walk 19 miles to an unsuspecting village. It was very clever of them. No one expected the lions to attack in the daytime. It's just not in their nature to do that. But are we really that easy to catch for predators? I mean, I said it myself a few minutes ago, we can't run fast or, for example, kick. But there must be at least something a human can do to fight back. Alas, according to the expert, when confronted with a large feline, an unarmed human becomes one of the most helpless creatures. He's literally incapable of doing anything. Fighting against sharp fangs and claws or powerful jaws? Nope, no chance of victory here. As it usually happens, attempting to hunt the man-eating pride proved futile. The usual strategies didn't work. A pair of brave Italian prisoners of war volunteered to shoot the man-eaters from a tree platform but a large male lion climbed it and spent the night clawing at the terrified humans clinging to the tiny branches above. Eventually, they decided to hunt down the lions and shoot a few at a time. It took a long time and was very dangerous, but it worked. After the death of two lionesses in 1947, there were no more man-eaters and life in Tanzania got back to normal. Seems like we talk a lot about big felines, but they're not the only ones who hunt people. Take, for example, the brown bear from Senkabetsu. It certainly can't compete with the other animals in our video today, based on the number of people it killed, but these kills were truly gruesome. Overall, the bear killed seven people between December 9th and December 15th, 1915, which is still the deadliest bear attack in Japanese history. The Asuri brown bear woke from hibernation early and did exactly what bears do in such a situation. It went into berserk mode. The animal first approached humans back in November when it entered the Ikeda family's house but was spooked by the horse and ran away. A few days later it returned, but the people picked up their guns and shot the bear several times. The wounds were non-lethal and the men followed the trail of blood, but a storm forced them to turn back. It had seemed that shooting and wounding should be enough to make the animal fear humans and steer clear of them. But the reaction of the bear was totally unpredictable and terrifying. On December 9, 1915, at 10.30 a.m., the giant brown bear turned up at the Ota family home, killing one man before overtaking a fleeing woman and then killing and eating her in the woods. According to contemporary descriptions, the scene resembled a slaughterhouse. The next day, the bear was wounded. Women and children hid in terror, and the guardsmen patrolled the area. The villagers believed that once the bear tasted human flesh, it will surely return to the village. Well, they were not wrong. On the evening of the same day, the bear broke a window in the neighboring house and made its way inside. There, it mauled five people, including a pregnant woman. It took 60 armed men to find the animal following the bloody trail and then kill it. To be fair, the bear was really huge. It weighed 750 pounds and was 9 feet tall. Sometimes chimps can be the cause of people's problems. Deforestation has created a serious problem for chimps in western Uganda. As their natural habitat was reduced, the chimps were forced to raid the crops of nearby villagers. The conflict caused suffering and casualties on both sides. The chimps were getting closer to the village for a year or two in search of food, plucking bananas from trees, grabbing mangoes, papayas, and anything else that tempted them. The first recorded attack occurred on July 20th, 2014, when a large chimp snatched a man and killed him. The situation was uneasy. Since 2014, at least three more people have died and six more have been injured or miraculously survived. And yes, the loss of natural habitat is to blame for that. One has to say, though, that chimps are aggressive by nature. They can easily reach a human through the bars of the cage and, for example, bite his fingers off. But if aggression occurs both in captivity and in the wild, what causes it? In their natural habitat, chimps form complex social groups that can involve violent clashes and even killings. Fighting each other is common among chimps, and when your life is full of violence, 
you just can't help but become aggressive. Chimps aren't the only problem, though. Monkeys are taking over Japanese cities. In the summer of 2022 alone, wild monkeys attacked at least 58 people in and around the city of Yamaguchi. However, no one knows why the monkeys are doing this. Could it be the culmination of years of conflict? Because monkeys terrorize locals in Thailand, Malaysia, and India too. But the interesting thing is that, so far, there are no laws that would enable the people to win this war. So don't be surprised if we all end up in Planet of the Apes one day. See you later.